and join me as we say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Growing up in the church, I always think of that as a prayer, and I always want to end it with a This is a time that we do need unity. We need unity in this country. We need unity in the state. And we need to flip the state. And so we're all here. Amen. Beth, Elizabeth, Wall, and all others, who will be an instrument in helping us flip the state. So before we get started, I want to recognize we have a couple of dignitaries. Obviously, Elizabeth is a dignitary. She is a town council uh, with a... Uh, Lacrosenta and Lacrosenta Manchas? Lacrosenta. So uh, we recognize her. I also want to recognize Bonnie, Bonnie Wallace. And then you so Bonnie Wallace, she's a candidate. She's a candidate for the Assembly District, uh, Assembly District Committee, AD uh, 41. So we recognize her. Are there any other candidates or anybody else who's running for office that didn't get your names? I thought we'd all be running for office. We are. <laughs> So to help us get started, we have a number of speeches that we're going to be listening to, and I'm going to invite my good friend Dennis, uh, Dennis Lamb up, and he's going to be our MC. You know him from Asia, Sky Media. Welcome, Dennis Lamb. Thank you, Samuel. Watch your step. Hello. Wow. Welcome to the party. And... Happy New Year! Happy New Year! Happy New Year! This is great. I'm so nervous, okay? And my name is Dennis. And how many of you know who is Dennis the Menace? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I know you know Elizabeth, okay? You must know <laughs> Don't hide your age. <laughs> so, very good. And I'm supposed to uh, have script. And then that's why. And then, because I'm Dennis the Menace, right? <laughs> Am I going to follow the script? I don't know. I try. <laughs> okay. Everyone here is for Elizabeth. And no. All of them know who she is. And she born in the year of the horse. Okay? And what's year of horse meaning? Year of horse is she's intelligent. Active. You can see how active she is, right? Lively, outgoing personality, empower them to like People love her. Like when I first start introduce Elizabeth to all the people, I, all I have to do is say, hey, get her a chance to meet you. You are going to love her. That's right. That's what happened. All I did is bring people to Elizabeth and everyone loves her. And she will put 100% energy into something she likes. Well, this is Chinese zodiac, okay? The Chinese zodiac didn't say something that you want to know. Is Elizabeth has six kids. She's going to introduce her kid to you. She has six kids? It's not a surprise, right? Chinese, six, ten, okay? Well, but the thing is, she homeschool all six kids. That is what we call jaw dropping. <laughs> Six kids. Oh, I have two. I want to get rid of them as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, after you pick up your jaw, this is drop it, right? Pick it up, take out your phone, and start following Elizabeth social media so you will know 
add more things about her? Also, your friends can find out more information about her. Okay? And now, after you pick up your job, let's welcome our lovely Elizabeth. <laughs> And he has been sacrificing to serve so many in this election season. Dennis and Nasa of Asian Spy Media, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for being here, friends, and I. I hope I've met everyone. I tried to get around already. And thank you so much for coming tonight and supporting us, supporting our campaign. My desire. <laughs> so many of you have already been helping us out there, knocking doors and making phone calls. I am going to show you some updates on a slide presentation of what we've been doing in this last year. Uh, be, but before I get to that, I had some thoughts this morning that I thought I'd just share with you. I, I really don't do the same speech everywhere I go, and this one just came to me this morning, and I don't even know if I'd call it a speech. It's really I'm sharing with you from my heart. And it's about, well, there was another campaign manager, not Samuel, who told me the best candidate is a narcissist because they love talking about themselves and it has been it has been a, a learning experience for me being on this campaign trail to learn to talk about myself because that hasn't been that hasn't been a, a big you know a big priority in my life. I've been a teacher but I usually don't talk about myself and it's been a life of service. I chose our slogan to be Love, Lives, Liberty, and Law. And I wanted to talk about love time. I usually say I love my country, your lives are important, and liberty operates when good laws promote peace and prosperity. <coughs> But tonight I wanted to talk about love um, in another, from another angle, because that's what was on my heart. Um, service is love. I've been serving my family, so we've got, so here's Ron, we've been married 34 years. And we've got three of the six children with us tonight. There's Abby. Yeah. Abby's getting married in April. Yeah. And then Tori. Yes, yeah. Tori. She, went, she drove all the way back to La Crescenta after arriving to pick up things that I forgot. And then all the way back. Oh, wow. Yeah, so she's such a Priscilla is usually with me helping. Uh, she is working tonight, uh, but most of you know Priscilla, and she has been working as our field director, so if you call the campaign, it's her thought. <laughs> and, then, and then Tori, Abby, and our oldest one, Rebecca, lives in Burbank, married with her three kids, so we've got three grandkids. And so, Sam, can you put that picture up? I've got, you know, I've got a doctorate in Christian ministry, so I've got some scriptures to share tonight that were on my heart this morning. Um, one is from 
Matthew 20, 25 to 28. Jesus said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to be great, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. And so as you think about the political environment these days, how many of our leaders present themselves as lording it over we the people or exercising an authority over we the people that they don't constitutionally have? And so I, I thank you for supporting me as one of you, as a mom, and I was saying Elena is my, my mom friend because we homeschooled our kids together. And it, and it, is, a, it is the design of our American system that we have representatives to lead us in Sacramento and Washington, D.C., who really represent us. Here's a, another, another verse. This is a famous chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. So I'm, I'm talking about love because it starts with love. Love, lives, liberty, law. But it starts with love. And so as I read these words to you about what love is, think about the, think about the politicians that are currently in office, those that you see on social media and the news, and do they represent the kind of character that our leadership in the United States should hold? Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. Love does not act unbecoming. Do we see some unbecoming behavior in some of our political people? Love does not seek its own. That's very hard to be in this arena and to be seeking the good of others, not just yourself. Love is not provoked. Love does not hold grudges. Love does not rejoice in what is wrong, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. It's been kind of hard to endure some of the last three years. And love never fails. So we start with love. Love, lives, liberty, law. And I just got to read you two more passages. Proverbs 31, 26. And this is a prayer of mine, and you can pray this for me. That she opens her mouth in wisdom, and on her tongue is a law of kindness. James 3, 13, 18 is about contrasting two different kinds of wisdom. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So as you pray for me, this is, this is, this next verse is the kind of wisdom. Pray for me. 
but the wisdom that is above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Public service is about humility and love. And it's about you. It's not about me. I just volunteer. This came to me in the morning. I just volunteer to be, in a way, the target of the enemy and carry the burden of responsibility for legal and financial risk and the burden of receiving criticism of proud and disgruntled people. But thank you, all of you, my friends, for being cheerleaders. And those that have donated, who believe in a cause bigger than your own personal comfort, and who are willing to carry the burden with me. I thank my family, and this is my sister-in-law, Irene. Thanks for being with us tonight, Irene. dedicated first to love God, and they love me, and they love our country. Yeah, and I, I am doing this. One of the reasons is to break the ground, make a way for their generation to follow. I thank, uh, I thank Samuel, our campaign manager. Thank you, Samuel. He's been stepping up from uh, his business, his business background, and um, to serve on the campaign. And he's been such a backbone to us. Thank you so much, Samuel. And he worked really hard to put tonight together. And Dennis and uh, Nasa, they also worked very hard to get this together tonight. Um, supporting. I say they're supporting freedom's cause everywhere around the world, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Mike Murrow and Joni for being with us tonight. He's been my mentor for the past two years, and I really appreciate his support and prayers and Joni. And then Ralph and Sandy Ramirez, thank you for being with us tonight. They have dedicated their lives to serving our country, and I really appreciate them standing with me in this campaign. And I wanted to mention Margaret because she made some beautiful centerpieces for us, and she, so everyone who has a talent and a gift. They've been contributing to, to our campaign to help us all um, have fun even while we're doing this, because it is fun. So for the music or centerpieces and um, comedy, thank you. <laughs> Dennis the Menace. Oh, okay. So our campaign, is, in a way, it's more like uh, mission work than a business. Because we, so we've been we've been around the world, South America, Asia, India, on um, doing humanitarian work uh, before 2018 when we decided we have to focus our energies on California. But if, you know, in mission work, you're always asking for money to support the mission. But this is even harder because we have to raise we have to raise money in order to get the word out and win an election. But it, it's not like saying, oh, please please give and contribute to feed these poor little, these poor little homeless children in Africa. It's, it's will you please give me thousands of dollars so that I can advertise. But it, so it, it's harder for me to ask for that. So I thank you for coming. Thank you for responding. Okay, so here's I'll show you some pictures of what we've been doing this last year. 
Um, well, this came out uh, yesterday or the day before, so and this is our sample ballot here in LA County. And there's their name. This is our candidate statement in the booklet. This is what we paid $14,000 for to the state of California or the LA County. Uh, San Bernardino County, we paid them $3,000 for the same thing. But, but thank you for, for contributing to our bet. Because um, now everybody's got it. This is, um, this is a, a quote that was really beautiful by Zach Brown, our consulting team. He says, this combined effort has propelled the Olives campaign to be the most active and impactful in the LA metropolitan area in the last decade, surpassing the legacy of Mike Antonovich. And Mike Antonovich's name is on you know, some of our roads. Our dedication to conserv conservative principles and genuine community engagement is resonating strongly, and with your support, we will continue to alleviate, to elevate our campaign to new heights. And uh, uh, Saturday, we sent out our first text messaging uh, reminder to Republican voters. So, and Ron was knocking on a door in Pasadena, and the man who opened the door said, oh, I just got the text message. I'll vote for her. Yeah. So this is, this is, So this is November 2022. I announced that we were running for state senate on the same stage with Dennis Prager and La Cunada. We've come a long way, a long way. Okay, uh, this was last January. Last January um, in Sacramento, we were knocking on legislative doors advocating for educational freedom. And then February, that was my birthday fundraiser last year to kick us off. And here we are, Mike and me and jo Jody and Ron at the uh, GOP convention last March. So we got, we opened our, our campaign office chairing with our KD Republicans. In April, we have these Mama Bear t-shirts that the volunteers are out there knocking on doors and we're in the community. This was in Monterey Park with Chinese American citizens. This was our July kickoff volunteer training day. And uh, so we're going to be, so these volunteers have been knocking on the doors every Saturday and we are, we're regrouping to make this last push through February, so you'll be hearing from us. <clears throat> Here are some of the, the big endorsements. I, I worked hard, the mic is up there, so that we could, I had to go through like 10 categories of things that the LA GOP wanted in order to give me an early endorsement. Sometimes, so in the past, the political parties have waited until after filing closes to do endorsement, but I needed an early endorsement so that so that I could be the only Republican in this race. And so we've got these are other endorsements that we've been working on. That we've been getting attention. So um, we did get the statewide GOP endorsement, which was important, so that. Here I, I show you there's, there's four Dems that are splitting their vote. <clears throat> and we get out the vote on our side. We'll make the top two <coughs> in this primary yes. and have our name on the ballot in November. Amen. So that's what we're working towards. That's right. Yes. Um, some breakdowns. So there's a large Chinese population in District 25. And these are the other, other ones, campaign highlights. These are some of the highlights of data that, that we have gathered from this last year, but it's, it's much higher than this because they say we put out 100 signs, but we've actually put out 700. So, so take more tonight. 
because people people will see and they've been they've been recognized. You know, I go here and I go there. And say, oh, I saw your sign. I'm like, yes. <laughs> okay. And here's our social media. We're trying to really pump this up this week. So I think you'll be getting you'll be getting calls to make sure that you start following and sharing. Because if we if we we have a great big list of contacts, and if everybody starts starts um, liking, sharing, you know, whatever it is, following, <laughs> it'll really pump it up for this last month. And so I think that was my update for you all. And enjoy the rest of the night. <laughs> Wow, okay. Uh, when I prepare my speech, Elizabeth tell me to make sure my work is clear, but I know you guys are hungry. <laughs> so let's have Michael, let's have prayer for the dinner. Thank you. I'm Michael. Hi, everybody I'm from Impact Harvest Church. And we, as our church, our uh, leadership fully support Elizabeth and, and her campaign and what she's called to do. Uh, so it's an honor to be here and to be with you guys. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, uh, we thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to gather here uh, in your name and to come and bless Elizabeth and in, his, in her campaign, um, may your will uh, to be done on earth as it, it is in heaven. Um, we're called to be the salt and light of this world, and we can continue to use Elizabeth and and her team uh, to be a vessel of yours. Um, may your light pierce through our community and bring the truth and love um, to the people um, that, that you love. Um, bless the food and bless the time uh, later tonight and may all the communications, um, conversations to be divine, uh, full of uh, your will and love. Thank you, Lord Jesus, in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we will start dinner and later we will have our greatest man in California, <laughs> Mike Morel, to speak. Okay, thank you. How is the food, everyone? We don't eat too fast because we still have lobster coming, okay? <laughs> and, oh, and one announcement uh, Elizabeth wants to make before the next speaker. <laughs> yes, I want to thank Mr. Elmer Yuan for joining us tonight. Thank you. He travels all over the world and he's here in Los Angeles um, for this for this week at least. Uh, yesterday was his birthday, so also happy birthday! Oh, that will be more of his introduction. I mean, Dennis will give more of Elmer Yuan's introduction in a bit, but I want to honor him and thank him for being with us tonight. One of the greatest freedom fighters in the world. Thank you. Courageous. Courageous. Thank you, Baba. Thank you. Thank you. I know. You know, hundred forty thousand dollar can get a house in Tennessee, right? <laughs> she can just move, right? Hundred forty thousand dollar can down payment a house in Amante, right? So, but she didn't do that. She paid for the ballot statement, right? She told you guys, right? She paid for the ballot statement because she really loved California. 
the next speaker. Um, it's like uh, hosting an Oscar award right now. Uh, and I need a book to announce Mr. Mike Morrell in case. Actually, everyone knows him. He is our. He has been legislator of the year by the Military Officer Association of America, California Young Republican Federation, and we keep AMPAC. And also uh, name him Faith Business Community Leader of the Year. This one is really hard to say. And uh, National Federal National Federation Independent Business Award, Guardian of Small Business Award. So he is a uh, businessman. He is our uh, former senator. And and the other thing is this quote is from Senator Brian Jones. This is what he helped us to do. That's what he said. I cannot wait to give each one of my kids a copy, a copy, and adding my own personal inscription to encourage them as they begin to get married and start families of their own. My prayer for you is that you will be encouraged as, and apply the wisdom and lesson your life too. This is what uh, Brian Jones said. If you don't understand what I'm saying, it's okay. Twenty dollar only, okay? Twenty dollar, okay? Get your own at the back later at the end. Twenty dollar, and please, please welcome my Maroon. The MS is doing great. Thank you very much. And by the way, on those books, it wasn't my idea to sell them here tonight. It's Beth graciousness. She thinks it's good for the family. And, um, and so anything we do, I'm going to pay, because I have to pay part of the book, and then I'm going to give her 50% uh, of the proceeds. So, so if I, so if I, uh, if I have your kids and your grandkids and your great grandkids and your great neighbors, whatever you'd like to do. Well, look at it. It's good to be here, ladies and gentlemen. Actually, let me reword that. It's great to be out of Sacramento and in a room full of people who are normal for a change. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, also, thank you uh, again, Beth, for having me. I appreciate that. I think Dennis is doing a great job. Don't you guys think that? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I just want my wife to stand up again because I'm uh, <laughs> Forty-six years, we've been married, and nine grandkids. We just wow. one just closed yesterday. One just closed yesterday a few weeks ago. <laughs> that was pretty good. So uh, again, I'm honored to be here. Two things that I have been told, all of us have been told, that we should not talk about: religion and politics. Raise your hand if you've heard that. We all have. My dad told me not. Um, and so, but yet, when you look at a casual study of history, uh, the two ways men seem to either uh, oppress other men and send them into a thousand years of bondage or set them free are through those two institutions. Those are the two most important things to talk about. But listen to what George Washington said when he was asked why the greatness in America become so powerful overnight. He said it's because the first time in human history where the best of Jerusalem intersected Athens. You know what that means? Jerusalem is the home of religion, and Athens is the home of politics. But he said what made America uh, the greatest nation in all of history was faith and politics, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm going to talk a little bit about both of those tonight, if you would. Most agree 
that we face some serious challenges, don't we? Uh, my friend Ralph over here was talking about Dr. Larry Arn, President of Hillsdale College, a great historian. Our two kids were fortunate to go there. But uh, he believes uh, that we've entered our third great American crisis. First was the Revolutionary War, second was the Civil War, and now the war we're in now, this cultural war. He thinks we're in a lot of trouble. And whether we're going to maintain our constitutional way of government, which provides freedom, or if we're going to descend into a despotic government, ruled by force and fear, with an aggressive hostility towards people of faith. How many here are people of faith? We're on their chopping block, and how many of you guys know that? Yeah, we do know that. So we've got some challenges to do. And so uh, Solomon says in the book of Proverbs that the duty of a parent, he starts off the duty of a father, is to leave an inheritance to our children's children, which I'm convinced that means more than just the financial aspect, the duty of God, country, and family to secure freedom for the next generation. Uh, wouldn't you guys agree? Yes. Of course you would. Thank you. Yeah, but yet today, every foundation is cracked. Can, can you guys notice that? It, it, it reminds me, remember Nehemiah said, he went to the king and he says, the walls are down. Doesn't it seem like the same thing as today? When I was growing up, look at my parents lived on a busy street corner and we didn't lock our front doors. My dad left his car in the driveway, not in the garage, and so he wouldn't lose his car keys, he left them in the ignition. Car never got stolen. How many of you would do that today? I mean, you don't do that. We used to be able to roam the streets at night, play baseball tonight, and ride our bikes all over again. We can't do that today. Ladies and gentlemen, Americans become, America has become a very dangerous place. And there's a lot of reasons for that, and I'm gonna go over that. One thing is, we have forgotten the God who made us, right? You know, it's interesting. Uh, in the book, Democracy in America, written by Alexis de Tocqueville, it's a 700-page classic. How many have heard of that book? Some of you? Anyway, he is sent by the French government to discover the secret of our genius and our success. So he travels with every corner of America then, and he records hundreds of recordings that it was not in her deep water seaport, it wasn't in her trade, it was not in her vast sort of Congress or her rich mines or her rich agriculture. That was not the greatness of America. He said, I saw the greatness when I walked into the churches and saw that the pulpits were aflame with righteousness. Did I understand? America is great because she is good. And when she ceases to be good, she ceases to be good. You don't want to encourage me too much, right? <laughs> but thank you. Um, but second of all, there's a comment attributed to him, and listen to this one, folks. You, you got to really, you got to. This one really hits home today. He said, "But if the pulpits are no longer a flame of righteousness, could it be that the people will no longer know the truth?" Folks, that's where we are here today. We have a lot of churches, unfortunately. America was based on churches and faith that have gone user-friendly, secret, sensitive, culturally relevant, and they don't want to take on the tough issues of the day. They just want to tickle the ears of men. So we, as people of faith, we've got to encourage you pastors to do that. So that's number one thing we have to do to save our country. Number two, I do believe there is hope for America, and I'm going to give you some reasons why in a minute, um, and they're not bony bone either. There are real things that I believe are going to deliver us. But I want you to know, I'm going to give you um, a, a notice here. I do believe America is first. I think we're going to win, but I think we're going to soon encounter some rough seas. And we may be called upon, in this, if we want to save our country, in the same spirit of our founders, when on that last paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, they mutually pledged to one another. Under the benevolent protection of God, their very lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. With sacred honor meant the deepest part of your soul you give to your fellow countrymen and women. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? And that's what we are going to be asked to do here, I believe, in the future. Because we've, not, we've done some things that have been really wrong. 
consider Congressman Fisher Ames said, all of history lies open for our warning, like a churchyard whose solemn lessons are chiseled in the hard stone of eternity, lessons that thunder to republic, your vices and your passions forbid you to be free. You know, I know a lot of you people go to church and read the Bible, but if you go back and if you remember when the Egyptians were living 430 years of captivity under the Egyptian pharaohs, um, Moses tells them, you're going to go to the promised land. And I went in that book of Deuteronomy, 34 chapters, and I went through and counted over 50 times. They're going to be given prosperity. Fresh streams of water, homes, pomegranate trees, olive trees, and they're going to have the peace and safety you to enjoy it. But there's a condition. It's a conditional promise. And over 50 times, God reminds them, or Moses, God through Moses reminds them, you're going to have to, for that national prosperity and peace, you're going to have to follow the moral laws, decrees, and commands. And again, he reminds them over 50 times of that. And so that's something that we need to remember, that we cannot give up our traditional morality. What do you guys agree? Yeah. 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 And right now we're seeing breakdown of law enforcement, our education, ladies and gentlemen. California is not doing well. You know, we're seeking, we used to be number one. Uh, we're not anymore, you know. Uh, I, I can't imagine we have this thing called Drag Queen Hour where there's actually grown men that call up the school and say, can we come and dance in front of your first graders provocatively? But worse yet, many of these schools are staying sure, come on in. Folks, we need to be in those schools. Even if our kids are grown, we're taxpayers. We have a right to be in those schools because it's our duty before for God, country, and family have to protect over those kids, even if they're not our kids. Wouldn't you guys agree with that? <laughs> so a couple other things, too. You know, the family split apart. That's one reason for my book, The Road to Restoring a Family. I talked to a man who's a prison guard just recently, and in his prison, 94% of those young men incarcerated come from fatherless homes. Uh, come from fatherless homes. That should be a statistic that, that really speaks to us. That, um, that is bad. But there's something worse. Our daughter used to be a professor at Arizona Christian University on political science. And she reminds me, the drag queen hour dad is bad, but she says there's something more sinister behind that. She said much of education today is laid in the foundation of Marxist ideology with the intent of separating a child from the parent and making the child a ward of the state. Folks, we have to stop that. The good news is, for the first time in my lifetime, you and this could be a movement, of, an organic movement, of hopefully a providence of God, but if you've noticed, parents are returning back to school boards. That should give us hope. This has never happened in any of our lifetimes. This is a new thing, and we need to be jumping on with those guys, helping them there, as well as going to our city council and telling them, stop this crime. Amen. 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 So there's, there's some solutions that I want to give you guys, okay? First of all, Samuel Adams, listen to what he said. Uh, I, I like him because he was a father of the Revolutionary War, right? Right. Anyway, he said, uh, we shall never be abandoned by heaven while we act worthy of his aid and protection. Think about what those words are saying. He said, we have a duty. Heaven won't let us down as long as we act worthy. So do you understand what he's saying? This is a proactive condition that we, the people, have to act worthy for God, for providence, to help us. Same thing when you look at Second uh, Chronicles, where you guys have heard the scripture, my people call by my name, repent of their sins, and turn from their wicked ways, God will hear from heaven and build their land. That's conditional. You know what the most important word in that whole paragraph is? What is it? If. If, if my people do X, Y, and Z, God's want wants to heal our land, ladies and gentlemen. But I think it, it must say, um, maybe we're not doing the if part of it, right? And I don't mean just you guys here, but it's many churches in general um, are not living up to that. God's ready to heal our land, I'm convinced. Um, but we, uh, not be that. by the way, I, I did point that out. I, I spoke to Ethan earlier tonight, a gentleman back here, and that's why I 
I brought, I wasn't going to bring up Alexis Tokyo, but with his comments, I thought it was really appropriate. One of the reasons I think is we've got to get the churches that engaged and uh, do what we've been called to do. And so the ball's in our court. God's not, uh, uh, God's for us, he's not against us. And so here's a couple of other things that we need to do. Uh, let me finish the last thing on, on prayer. Uh, the National Day of Prayer, the model was that the fervent prayers of the righteous avail of much, right? And so Joni helped me because I was going to speak on that. And so she looked up the word fervent. In that context, it means a person who prays with intensity and passionately for their country and for all other things. But also, the prayers of the righteous. A righteous is a person who is a representative of God who follows the divine law. So here's my point. Again, that's our duty to follow the divine law. We have to be known as a representative of God. We have to pray with passion and intensity, and our prayers will profit when we do those things. So there's a lot of things that come back in the our court. And I'm going to get to that in a minute because the same thing our government was established on was the Constitution. It's proactive by we the people, not they the government. And I'm going to go over those in a second why we need to be involved with government. I want to talk, people have asked me over the years, what's the most important thing I can do to help my country? Well, you can help Beth um, because she needs help. It's a tough district, but if we can win here, we can win another district. And she will represent this. I have no doubt she will represent us well. She'll follow with the divine law. She's a representative of God. But the thing that I love about her, is she, I, I've met a lot of candidates that call up one guy, truth. Right before the election, the November election, I said, how long have you been walking doors for? He goes, we're starting next week. And it's three weeks till the election. You know, she's, she called me two years ago and said, hey, I hope you don't mind helping me. Uh, but I'm going to start early, you know, elections in two or three years. You know, that's how you want to fight. We don't win elections because we, I, I get people call me all the time, and they're going to start six months, two months, four months, five months. I asked one guy, how many uh, votes are you going to need? He didn't know how many. He was a member of Congress. That's 750,000 voters in each district. He didn't know how many voters went in there. The last four elections, I asked him, what did the other guy win? What did it take for him to win? He didn't know the percentages. I, I have no idea why people like that run. That's why I'm, I've been so impressed with that. Because she's doing everything. She's following the playbook. She's doing everything. But you guys have to help push her over. Don't push her over the edge. You push her over the edge. <laughs> the campaign will push her over the edge. So, so that's one way we can help out. But let me tell you another important thing. We have to speak out. When we're silent, it only emboldens evil. This politically correct speech, ladies and gentlemen, it's been around for thousands of years, but it's designed to keep us quiet. Here's why. When they start talking with them like that, blaming us and accusing us, they do that because they know they can't win the argument. You understand? The fact that they know they can't win the argument, that means we can win the argument. And, and here's why we can win the argument. If you look, there is a, such a thing as self-evident truth. Second paragraph in the Declaration of Independence. Self-evident truth, the first paragraph says it's placed there by the God of nature, the, the, the laws of nature, nature's God. Meaning God places self-evident truth throughout human nature, history, and even as Romans chapter Paul tells us, he writes truth on every man's heart and mind. And so we can win this battle, but what happens when we're told to be quiet? I'm surprised, you know, we're, we're nice Christians, we're good. We can win, but we can't do it if we don't talk, ladies and gentlemen. We can't let people shut us up. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, the bad thing about Christians is we're a little bit too nice. You know, the scriptures tell us that the talk, you know, it says that we're to refute bad ideologies. It says we're to demolish arguments. And then the next one I really like was it's proactive. Our duty is to tear down, tear down every protection that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. When we're silent, it only emboldens evil. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Again, ladies and gentlemen, we have to be proactive. We have to defend our faith. We have to defend politics, and we have to talk about those things. And another thing, too, when we get involved with government, uh, one of the goals, like, you know, that you, you've heard about, everybody thinks democracy or republic is an easy thing, right? Uh, it's a one-two thing. We'll get this one law passed. Everything's going to be good.
Good. Freedom, you have to fight for every generation, for decades, folks. And people like this thing about term limits. Raise your hand, right? But we've had term limits for over 20 years in California, and we, the people, are sending worse people up there every two or two to four years. So it's not working, term limits. Do you understand? The founders put term limits, by the way, in the Constitution. They referred to them as elections. But it was up to we, the people, to vote for the right people. The very foundation of the Constitution is the Declaration of Independence. And that says in there, the whole thing is based on to secure these rights, meaning our freedoms. Governments are instituted amongst men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. Meaning we give our consent how we want to be ruled. Folks, we got to do a better job at that. And um, we just have to do a better job at that. Yeah, and again, I want to re remind you that this was to be a government of by and for the people. And uh, Reagan said it this way. He said that uh, the car is the government, and the people are the driver. We're supposed to tell the car which way to go, not the other way around. And so we have to get back to that, taking the government. It, it, we cannot be bashful about it, ladies and gentlemen. And again, that's one of the reasons I'm supporting Jeff, because I have all the confidence I've seen a lot of good people who go to Sacramento and then they get a little, uh, uh, they're worried they're going to lose their election, so they compromise and they end up uh, not accomplishing anything. Then they lose their race and then they start posting on Facebook things they should have said when they were in office, but now no one's listening to them. I have all the confidence in Beth that she's going to follow. What And if you do buy my book tonight, you know, I've got some people that are buying multiple copies for their kids and that sort of thing. I, I just want you to know, um, I, I'm going to split, you know, I have to pay for those books, but I'm going to split the rest with uh, Beth. So if that's one way you can help her in a campaign if you want to do that. So that would be good. Okay, a couple of bright spots, and then I should be done in about seven minutes. Does that work? Okay, thank you. Uh, that I see happening that may be a movement is. Parents are motivated in returning to school board meetings. In Silicon Valley, San Francisco, you know those parents got rid of three school board members? And in San Francisco, my goodness gracious. Yeah. Out here with, uh, in, uh, Pastor Tim Thompson, Marietta Temecula, he raised up seven people in his church and got five out of the seven elected to the school board. And I'm happy to say that that made Governor, Governor uh, Newsom, who we live under uh, Gavinomics here in California, and uh, he fined them with that a million dollars. Did you guys know that? Yeah, because he didn't like that they're taking these nasty books that he probably likes to read at night when he's alone. So, anyway, uh, plus another thing too that happened, remember our last president appointed three. Uh, uh, constitutional judges to the bench. Our son happened to be involved with that. And he worked on a, a, a thing where they raised up judges and one of his duties was to find constitutional judges and get them appointed to the federal benches. And that administration appointed 237 congressional judges yeah. to the so, so there are things going on and that's why we can't give up Oh, I want to share one other thing, talking to Ethan now. He has a podcast, right? So I I didn't I just used to listen to Rush Limbaugh, right? That's the only thing that I was I miss that guy. But there's a whole subculture of podcasts. I've probably been on 40 podcasts. I've never heard of some of these guys, and they've got like a million followers. I mean it's a whole underground sort of thing that's moving. And the majority of them are, are conservative. It's awesome. So there's something going on, and those guys are reaching the younger generation. So we can't give up hope on America. Think about this: the rich heritage California has, right? The first state was over 21 missions. Think about that. Sacramento means the city of Sacramento. Joey and I were just up on Highway One in Santa Barbara the other day, and there's a sign that says El Camino Real, which means the Highway of the King. And so, um, World Vision, focus on the family, campus to save for Christ. We're all found in here, the Azusa Street Revivals. So, so here's my point of mentioning that. 
Um, at one time, this was God's state, and I'm convinced he wants it back. But it's up to us to deliver it to So I have a closing uh, thing. I read this just the other day. And I want to close with this. It's from Psalms. And I, I thought about this with all the chaos going on. I had just been watching, you know, some guy break into a liquor store and stealing food and beating the guy up across the aisle. And I'm going to make this horrible. And then uh, guys like Gaston apparently don't want to arrest him. Uh, and so law and order is, uh, is God, ladies and gentlemen. So listen to the songs. I, I like it. And I'll close with that. And... Uh, What's that? Oh, I thought somebody said something. Okay, and the one who gives victory to kings, who delivers his servant David from the deadly sore, please deliver me. Then our sons in their youth will be like well-nurtured plants, and our daughters will be like pillars carved to adorn a palace. Our barns will be filled with every kind of provision. Our sheep will increase by thousands and by tens of thousands in our fields, and our oxen will draw heavy loads. Listen to this. There will be no breaching of walls, no going into captivity. And here's the one that when I watch the news that I want to get back to. There will, there will, there will be no cry of distress in our streets. Why? Because blessed is the people of whom this is true. Blessed only are those people whose God is the Lord. Amen. Amen. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Vote for Elizabeth. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys very much. Well, in the book, chapter 13, how does one expand his or her territory? Through generosity. In fact, the Word of God often teaches us things in a practical way, and give, giving it, a giving is one of those things he has. So we have a duty apart from the benefit of obedience. It is true, or it is true, that God often blesses those who obey Him. Thus, there seem to be practical reasons for why we should tell how it benefits us. I didn't just buy one book for myself. I bought a total of five. One for myself, three for my good friend. Two of my good friends is my son. <laughs> So, at, at only twenty dollars today, and I think it's with such good food, right? So definitely put down fifty. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, uh, I'm honored also, and I'm uh, really honored. I we have a speaker, MIU today. He is a businessman. I think I think Casio, right? Before Casio, you make those digital watches. He is the first one. He made it. So he's you know really successful businessman. And because he loved Hong Kong so much, he gave up a lot of things. I I told him yesterday. He is like a Benjamin Franklin to us. Because there's no Hong Kong government here. 
the not the the no, 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 real Hong Kong yet. And uh, Emma is going around the world trying to develop a system, an election system, which we already have, right? And he is going around the world trying to develop an election system for Hong Kong, uh, so we can vote, we can select our leader for Hong Kong. So, and then, so, and uh, because it's a, uh, uh, his uh, birthday. I want everyone to uh, say a happy birthday to uh, Elma while he's coming up and speak. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Elma. Happy birthday to you. My 75th uh, birthday. Oh, wow. <laughs> Normally I don't celebrate because uh, we are Hong Kong businessmen and time is the essence. I have to spend, concentrate in making money. <laughs> so, and that, that's the way Hong Kong has been. And uh, I was born in Shanghai when I was seven years old, uh, came to Hong Kong. So, um, and then I had my uh, grade school and high school in uh, Hong Kong, and then I came to the States for college education. I've been doing business here in the States uh, for almost 20 years. And then, uh, as you know, China was booming uh, about from 20 years ago, so I lived in Beijing also another 10 years, and then 10 years in Shanghai. Very familiar with the US and uh, China relationship, and what, what the historical and what's going to become. And uh, right now, um, I'm a, I'm a, there's a warrant for my arrest because I've decided to go after the communists. Yeah. They taken over, they've taken over Hong Kong. Yes. And uh, with communism, uh, a little bit of history, which I think we should know, Hong Kong was a colony, a British colony uh, from the Opium War in 1842, was seated in parts to uh, UK, to, to England. And then, uh, basically, uh, we were all British subjects. Yeah. And then, uh, uh, China demands to have it back. And the British don't want to have trouble because the British uh, trading companies have huge interest in Hong Kong, including the British banks, like the Hong Kong Bank and the Charlie Bank. So instead of having a problem with China, he gave us a way to the communist China without even uh, asking us for a referendum. Normally, if you give a colony to whatever become a colony, decolonize, when you decolonize, you need to ask the people. It's like the Brits leaving the uh, European Union, they have to have a referendum by the people. Nothing to do with the Queen or the Prime Minister or the Parliament, it's the people. We never had the chance. The British will have to protect, make sure that they can continue to do business. Huge, they were making a huge amount of money because when China opened up, all the goods were going through Hong Kong. So, and also shipping out of Hong Kong. And the British uh, trading company made so much money. Just take, for example, like uh, cigarettes. They were the agent for cigarettes, and when China opened up, they were all smoking imported cigarettes. Huge amount of money. Talk about billions of dollars per year. So it was given away, and then they had an agreement uh, on called the British Sino-British De Joint Declaration with all the terms. Uh, that was made in 1987, and then Hong Kong was handed over in 1997. And uh, uh, the Chinese, in the first three years, pretty good, you know, will follow the German operation. And then in the fifth year already, start, things start going downhill. They already break all, the, all their promises. And we Hong Kong people wanted one thing. We always had the freedom and the rule of law. But we wanted to have a say in the government. So we wanted a democracy, a representation. It was promised to us 
will be able to um, to elect our our legislative council and the uh, chief executive by universal suffrage. But the communist knew biggest problem uh, in uh, with the, uh, their their biggest problem are the people. Once the people are organized, then they are going to do away with communism. And the other thing they are afraid of is religion. Uh, religion. So uh, anyway, the communists broke all their rules and uh, when our young people went on the street to, uh, to ask for an for, um, for, uh, election, a uh, true election, they, they delayed and finally they decided they can't hide anymore because the whole world was watching. So they decided to uh, impose the national security law, which is very, very strange. And for any reason, whatever it is, they can arrest you. And so all of a sudden, not only we didn't get the democracy, uh, the election, right to elect, we, all, so we also lost our freedom and the rule of law. So it's gone. Um, and that, that's why I decided that I must come and do something. Because I lost with my father, my parents lost everything, their freedom and business in Shanghai. Uh, and then now it's the second time <laughs> to lose everything in Hong Kong. I have to move away, so I, we've decided to, I've decided to go. And uh, those are my supporters. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, um, how to fight, how to fight. And tonight you give me a very good idea. Not only people's power, but also the faith in God. Yeah. Together with these two, there is a chance. You may not win, but there's a better chance. Yeah. Right. Uh, the communists are trained from kindergarten. They are trained. They are trained to fight capitalism. You know what we have. When you have money in the bank, that's called capital. Right? You can invest, right? 401k, that's capital. Uh, when you have a house in your name, that's capital. And communists want to do away with everything. They provide. They provide. They want to provide and control. That's the way communists work. And same thing I see happening here. Very much so. So anyway, I've decided to, uh, four years ago, I've decided to, um, to get help. And the only country we get help is the United States. I mean, if you look at history from World War II or the World War I, you guys didn't fight for themselves. <laughs> you are you are safe here in the, in the North America, but you fought in Second World War. A lot of people died for other people's freedom. And uh, in Japan, of course, in the in Pacific, you fought for the uh, for, for Chinese freedom against the Japanese. The, no, there is no other country willing to do such sacrifice because of the Christian faith. You believe that everybody should be um, should have the freedom. That's why so many people die for that. But they don't really understand. Uh, people in Europe understand a little bit more because most of them are Christians, or at least have Christian uh, ancestry. But in Asia, we didn't have a Christian background, so they really never appreciated what the U.S. have done for them. Right? And then we sent a religious group. Uh, and uh, um, Elizabeth, you were there. So, done a lot to, but unfortunately, the communists are so strong, so well organized. So we've been losing, and uh, I'm sure you you were in China, right? So, uh, and, and we've been losing. My mother was a Jehovah's Witness in Shanghai, and uh, in 1957, the communists said, religion is like opium, because they want to control people's religious belief by using communism. They say, why don't you just believe in communism, like a religion, and do away with everything else. So in 1956, my mother and all the religious leaders, Catholic or Protestants, Buddhism, Muslim, all, all of them were arrested. And everyone got 20 years labor camp. All right. Labor camp means you don't get to get a trial. They send you directly from the police station to the camp. Camp means a work camp, right? like an archipelago, you know, like a, a, the Russian Siberia ones. So anyway, I share the feeling with you right away. 
So uh, anyway, my mother never surrendered. But the way I see it is the communists, what they did to Hong Kong, what they did to my mother, meaning that the biggest, two biggest enemies are the people and, the, and God. And God. So uh, we were talking here while, while you were uh, within our Cantonese table. <laughs> that what is the solution? What is the solution? In fact, to be honest, we are, we are losing. We are losing. But how to recover? There has to be a solution. Faith is very important. But on top of faith, we need to have a plan, a system. How to, how to get back? Hong Kong is lost. So I, what I'm trying to do is to get Hong Kong people worldwide, including Hong Kong, to use their mobile phone to elect a uh, Hong Kong parliament so that we can make their new constitution and try to fight against the communism. Um, but, uh, so I'm trying to get back to the people song, people song, but uh, um, very difficult, very difficult, but no, we'll, we'll try. And uh, here, of course, when I came here, uh, 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 a lady with a Chinese heritage, I said, I must come, even though I don't really understand what's happening until I've been here. So, so but uh, I've also supported another Chinese lady from Taiwan in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in District 15. <laughs> District 15. Ah, uh, 15, right? Yeah. And uh, anyway, I think it's, it's about time the Chinese pay back. Uh, because, look, if uh, we didn't have US, we'd be speaking Japanese. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, it's very important that uh, we must pay back. And uh, hopefully, like Elizabeth, the Chinese heritage. Uh, and most Chinese are very cold when it comes to politics. They say, I make money, my kids will do well, become doctors or whatever. They're happy with that. But that's not enough. Very similar in there <laughs> with our Vietnamese friend. Very, very similar. We need to be part of this country. This is the greatest country in the world. That's the We like, the, we like the U.S. eventually, the way I see it now, even though I may not agree with Biden, I'm more of a Trump supporter. Yeah. 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 Trump, 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 Trump. Uh, overall, in the last four years, I think Trump started with the trade war, and people start waking up. How the communists have been taking advantage right. of U.S. You pay came from everything. Yeah. They make twenty trillion dollars, twenty trillion dollars yeah. from US in the last four years. Wow. Right? You imported their goods, and then you take their company public, and then you lend them money, and then people here are sending back money. They kept all the US dollars and give uh, the funny paper to their people. Yeah. So this is what you basically build up China, especially the worst case. You have built up communism, the CCP. They, with that money, they suddenly feel that they don't need you anymore. Uh, they want to replace you as the as the as the world number one. They want to replace you, and they think, oh, never never said thank you. They never were never grateful to us. Everything the Chinese rise was purely depend on U.S. money because you had a lot of retired funds. You have uh, insurance funds, retirement funds, all that money to invest in China. Investing meaning you use your capital. In order to be successful, you have to have capital. So China has very smart people but with capital. That's how they succeeded. It's the people's power, nothing to do with communism. So I'm, what I'm trying to say is we need help from you. And uh, we need to uh, work very closely together because communism is terrible. Just look at the look at the virus, right? And look at the, the COVID. I think the total loss in the world uh, in life maybe about seven, eight million, not including the Chinese loss of life. So including over ten million loss, life loss, and then money-wise maybe about a hundred trillion dollars. Hundred. This country lost about. 50 trillion dollars from COVID. 
but nobody there, nobody is out talking about it. it. It looks like they, uh, Biden has uh, forgiven the Chinese. It yeah. all came from China for late reporting. They, he dragged on, Xi Jinping dragged on for two months before he let the world know there's such a contagious virus in China already. And so that's, he, they're purely 100% responsible for the loss, 100%. And somehow, hopefully, Trump will, uh, will uh, go back and ask them for compensation. So um, we, need some, we need a stronger, stronger Lincoln, uh, 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 Jay Sullivan. For some reason, as if um, they are very, very soft to China when it comes to critical movement, soft to, you, to, to Iran. It's, it's really wrong. If you look at all the problems right now in the world, right now, today, China is behind the wall. Starting from, starting from uh, North Korea, threatening South Korea, China is behind the 100%. Right? And also threatening Japan. And then you have the Taiwan Strait. Uh, threatening Taiwan, and then uh, South China Sea threatening the Philippines. Right? And then here you have the, uh, in uh, India, there's a, there's a conflict, a huge conflict, all started by the, by the communists. And then, of course, we, have, we know how bad it is in the Middle East. They want to start it all together, and Ukraine, of course. They want to start all these things at the same time, so that this administration, which Biden is already very weak, hardly spend much time in the White House. So we, that is why they want to use this moment when everybody is busy, so they can attack Taiwan. So it's that's all there to keep you busy. And you can see that uh, Blinken and Sullivan they flying back and forth, just trying to press too many fires, too many fires to put off around the world. So we, we need to work together. Of course, we understand you are running for state centers, but it's the feeling, it's the, uh, the people. In the end, the people elect the uh, congressman in Washington. And uh, it's already making a big difference. The Congress is very, very anti china the anti ccp And uh, um, so I think uh, what I'm doing this year, for instance, I'll spend maybe like uh, uh, three quarters of my time in the States uh, trying to lobby and also try to help uh, help uh, make Trump. And then uh, we have uh, Gallaghan, Gallaghan and uh, Chris Smith. So, because they, they make decisions on China and Asia. So we need to support them also. But I'm more than happy to, to travel uh, around the, the states and to give, try my best to help the conservatives. I believe that uh, this country is going down here very fast, especially California. Unbelievable. I came to California, I visited California. I student, I was in New York. But then doing business, I came to uh, California in 1970. So I've been here around 50 years. I know everything here. You know, I, I even have a company here in Ventura. So I know everything, but it's been going down. Unbelievable. And uh, we cannot let this happen. What happened to Hong Kong today is going to happen to you tomorrow. It's going to happen. The same, the same, but may not be identically, may not be called CCP. But this group is even worse. Yeah. Right? Yeah, the CCP, at least they have a name. You know, we, we recognize them as communists. But here they call themselves all kinds of things. But what they do is exactly the same as CCP. Right? So we need to do something to it. We need a solution. Democracy is fine. But we need to work harder for a solution to get rid of CCP. And how to preach the words of God. That's right. We need to how to preach to the young people. It's a big problem, you know. I travel around the world, uh, U.S. a lot. We are losing the youth. California used to be very. I remember when I came here, it was very conservative. Now it's terrible. It's a mess. So how to get the young people involved? Of course, the, the, they've invested in the young people for a long time, ruining your, your education system. But we need to have a solution, not just. Uh, just blind faith is not enough. You need to have faith and action. So uh, I hope something is really done to help on such an important thing.
and it's very, very deep, deep into the book. We need to do so. So I'm sorry I don't have a really prepared speech, but I, I was trying to understand the first time we meet. So anyway, I wish you luck, and uh, I'll, if you see me again, I'll be more than happy. I'm not very happy. I have a lot of friends in the, in the, in in LA, but most of them are very are all left, <laughs> all on the left. So, uh, so uh, uh, hopefully we will we'll, we'll, uh, we'll work together, and uh, I hope you will win. Thank you. And the other person I'm about to introduce, love California so much. He fight for us, and he also kind of like a mentor to me, introducing me into the politics. I only been in politics about a year and a half. He is trying to bring me into central committee to learn all the system, learn how how it works. So, uh, our Colonel, well, one minute, and please welcome Yay. Colonel. I should have taken my glasses off. <laughs> Anybody have tried vocals? Three, three lenses? It's really tough when you get the steps. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Dennis. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, De Dennis uh, is a stalwart American patriot. Now, he has to have a, a Hong Kong heritage. No, well, forgive me for that. Uh, <laughs> but I've, I've been in, in Hong Kong. I spent a lot of time in Asia. I spent uh, 40 years in the military and so, uh, and, and the State Department. So I've served in most of every country in the Pacific. And um, somebody asked me the other day, what about all those medals and ribbons and stuff you have? What are you the most proud of? And I thought about it, and I feel the most proud of are those recognitions I receive from governments. From the Rizal, the medal of rock and Rizal from the Philippines. From the liberation of South Korea. The Red Heart, Open Heart, they call it, from Taiwan, from the government of Taiwan. Really interesting stories. I had no idea I was going to get these things. But now, the whole foreign things on this side, and all the National Guard and Navy and Army, uh, turned on this side. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about today, we talked about a lot of the problems, and we talked about what I call Big JC, Jesus Christ. Amen. And when we talk about a moral conduct, our Constitution, if you've ever read the little book, have you ever been fortunate enough to see the original Constitution of the United States, the Articles of Independence, our Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights? It's an awe inspiring a little piece of paper, a little piece of paper. It's not the paper. It's not even the words. It's what those stand for. We're talking about moral conduct. We're talking about something that we here today know in our heart. And we know in our head. But how do we put it together? I'm going to talk to you about how we can take back California. California is not entirely lost. I'm a fifth generation American. And I'm the first generation of California. My dad came from Arizona. In the middle of the Depression, you think it's bad today. Imagine 30% of everybody who was a worker, unemployed. No Social Security, no unemployment insurance, no short-term disability, no handouts. You might have a food line, but it would be probably the Salvation Army. Government has taken over from nothing in that period of time. 
to today, government controls our lives. The regulations of what you can drive, what you can't drive, what you're going to subsidize, what the government controls everything. That's a hidden bureaucrat, unelected people who run everything we do today. How do we take our country back? How do we take our rights as American patriots back? I had a gentleman that I interviewed. I'm a uh, certified military oral historian. And I interviewed maybe 100 people, mostly World War II guys. And I interviewed a man of World War II. And I asked him, it's about that tall. I said, why did you fight Japan? The most formidable army in the world at the time. The best trained. The best equipped. The most heroic, hard-working military in the world at the time. And all you had were sandals, a pair of shorts, a little palm hat. You didn't have any tanks. You didn't have any machine guns. You didn't have any artillery. Why? Why didn't you take that stuff and go back to your village? Why would you fight for a country 7,000 miles away that you've never visited? And he said, well, it's a long story. And he said, the bottom line is, I fought for Mother America. We've got to realize, this is Mother America we're talking about. Not some little removed thing from us. Every single day, you've got to be fighting this battle. You've got to become a patriot. You've got to understand that those people who oppose us, they're not just Marxists, they're not just communists. They want to take over your very life. They want to take over everything you do think possible. Because they're going to be the elites. I call them the bureaucratic elites. Because they could care less. Because they're so smart, right? That they're going to end up with everything. La plata, as they say in Spanish. The silver and the gold. Because they're going to try and rule the roost. And they've been very effective at it. But since Trump, and before that, we've begun with people in the leadership role like Mike Morrell. We've begun to take it back. Let's talk about California for a quick second. We have a California Assembly. We have a California set, set, Senate. Thank God it was a Wong Ollers is running for that seat. Yeah. There, are, there are 40 senators in California, like Mike Morell was. 40 senators. Roughly a million apiece, right? 39, 40 million? Yes. Roughly a million apiece? Pretty close. I ran for Congress twice, and I lost both times. The first time, I lost by 500 Wow. A guy named Mark Garcia represents out there far west San Fernando Valley. Got elected by country to Congress by just about 500 votes. Now you look at a congressional seat, you look at a senatorial district, almost the same size as far as voting and as far as potential turnout. Now let's think about that. I lost like 500 votes. There are roughly 500 precincts in the Senate district and in the Congressional district. That means one person for every 250 households. One person. And Mike Garcia would not have been elected to Congress. I would have been elected to Congress. And hopefully in 500 votes we're going to elect Elizabeth Wong College in November. We did. We got The only way we do this, we take back a little bit. Forty senators. You know how many are Republicans? Give me some guesses. Eight. 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 Who said eight? eight. Who said eight? You cheated. You knew. <laughs> eight senators. We can put them in a minivan. 
right? Yeah. That means 32 Democrats can outvote anybody. Republicans absolutely have almost no say in California government. You understand that? We have no say. But who's going to get blamed when anything goes wrong? Or when you American patriots say you're a bunch of liars. Oh, no, 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 it's not us. It's those Republicans. It's Trump. It's those terrible people. They're all a bunch of racists. Right? We know they're lying. Yeah. Laugh in their face. Laughter kills these people. They cannot function with humor. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they don't know how to let you know. Because all they can do is point their finger and say, Oh, you're a bad person. But they don't really know that we're American patriots and we got the Constitution on our backside. We understand what it is to be a little piece of paper. All the inalienable rights is what Mike says. That's true. God given, not by a piece of paper. If you look at the contact, if you ever read the Communist Manifesto, oh man, you'd want to be a communist. Wow, look at all the rights I'm going to have. But who controls those rights? The elitists. Do you, you think that uh, Putin or Xi, they sit at home counting their pennies to see how they're going to pay the bills? No, they live a luxurious lifestyle. These guys have been raping and pillaging the West for years, as you talked about. The heart of all of this is money. The heart of all of this is money. That's their motivation. So how do we get ourselves back? With eight senators, we only had six just a while back. We made a road. We made two. Two more senators. And if we get two more this time, we're going to kick them in the shin. And we're going to get a bit more. On the assembly, we have 80 members of the California State Assembly. Mike was a member of the State Assembly. 80 members. How many are Republicans today? 22. Give me a guess. 30. Just give me a guess. Come on. 30. In the back. What did you say? 30. 30. Well, you get, you get exaggerated. That's what I hope they have. We only have 24. No, hey, Mike. 25. We had 29 when I started. It's now 18. 18. 18. Uh, we're starting to pick up, though. We've got one in L.A. County. <laughs> 24 seats, one in L.A. County for Republican. So anybody from the mayor of L.A. City to the Board of Supervisors, there's only one Republican out of five, but they're going to blame you. They're going to blame you as a Republican because they don't know that you've got a brain and you've got a heart. And you know that the only thing we can change. So I'm going to show you how we're going to change all this. With only 17, 18, 15, we end up with 20. we got a chance to pick up two or three seats. I'm going to ask you to do something right now. Take out a pen, any piece of paper. I want you to write your name, the city, and your email address. Because I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do with it. Every year, for many years, Sandy and I wrote Ralph and Sandy's picks, like with the racetrack, our handicap, right? They prosecute the President of the United States because they're going to try and stop him from being president, no matter how hope that they're going to lie, they're going to cheat. The only one who's standing between us and a possible victory is Elizabeth and President Trump. We have one opportunity, and our opportunity is right now. Our opportunity, I don't know what's happening to Mike, but we'll try it. That one work better? That one work? Let's get, can you hear me this better? Okay, great. All we have is this one opportunity. One opportunity. So I'm going to ask you to give me your email address. We'll mail you by email, but I want you to, before you put it down, give it to the person next to you and have that person read it. If he can read it, 
Then I can read it. <laughs> if he can't read it, give it back and have him redo it. <laughs> because we have an opportunity, a unique opportunity, to take our nation back. One vote, one assemblyman, one senator, one congressman at a time. We can't do it all overnight. But if we get our neighbors out, so I'm going to ask you to send that to me. I'm going to send him a list. And you say, oh, that's wonderful. I'll mark my absentee ballot. Oh, wow, well, I'll be able to do all that. That's not the deal. The deal is you have to give it to five people. Your neighbor, your friend, your brother, your sister. And say, this is gold. Mark your sample ballot according to this. 90% of the people, they might know that if they're lucky enough and fortunate enough. But they don't know many other people. They certainly don't know judges. And they probably never met Supervisor Captain Barton. Probably not. Or Cruikshank is running for the, for the Board of Supervisors. We have a unique opportunity. So by doing something personally, have you had anybody check them out to make sure those email addresses are legible? So they're legible. What that means, you're going to have an opportunity to influence five votes. If we took everybody in this room, that alone could swing an election for better. That alone could swing an election for better. That alone could make Beth the next senator from the district. I want, I want you to know how very valuable what you, that little stamp is. We're not a democracy, we're a republic. And we elect people like Beth and people like Mike to represent us. That's what a republic is. A Democrat is ruled by everybody, 50 to 1 vote, and will take your toy away from you. That's what the communists do. So they keep talking about democracy. We're not a democracy, we are a republic. So anybody who says, oh man, you guys are horrible, oh, 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 you're trying to mess up our democracy. Tell them that's a P.S. We're talking about a republic. <laughs> Educate them and smile like you poor stupid idiot. You don't understand. <laughs> you have to realize that these people have absolutely no leg to stand on because it's based on lies. It's based on misinformation. It's based on anything they can do to intimidate you. So if they can talk you to not vote and believe all that junk, oh, they're all Republicans, my God, they're all a bunch of racists. Right? They hear that all the time. Who said that? Did Trump say that? No. Even Terry Lake in Arizona. How about, what's your face? Uh, help, hey, what about? I don't like her, but some people do. <laughs> but she's a Republican. Any Republican is better than a Democrat. Any Republican is better than a Democrat. Yeah, here. So far. If you look at how many Democrats are out there on our, on our ballot, around here in LA County, every look at the city council for school boards. You have an opportunity. I was asked this evening, what if we went 100 people to a city council meeting? I was a member of the city council. And I'd say, oh man, I'll listen to anything you say. But as soon as you're gone, I forgot you. I don't know who you are. But you keep coming back every meeting, I'm going to start to listen to you. So stick to it. Fight for Mother America. Realize you have the opportunity. The absolute unique opportunity. Nowhere in the world is it possible. Nowhere in the world is it possible to do what you have with your vote. Nobody does. So tell that neighbor, those five people, and say, here's the way you should vote. If you want to take my advice for a good friend of mine. But what happens, what happens, if you say, oh, that junk, I'm not going to stay at home. I'm not going to vote. It's a waste of time. How many times have we heard that? We all have. 
Right? When you do that, when you say, I'm going to stay home, the heck with it. What happens? You guarantee the elitists, the communists, the Marxists are, are going to win. Because you have not voted. In L.A. County, there's almost a million Republicans registered to vote. If they voted, just 80% of them. We can win every single election in L.A. County. But they sit home and they give up and they buy the junk that you see on CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, and all the other mainstream media. The only paper I ever read now is the Epic Times. I don't read the L.A. Times. I don't even read the Wall Street Journal anymore. And I've been in financial services for 60 years. So I can tell you, I read, I used to read it all the time. What's happened is they've sold out for money. Who built, as he said, Albert? Who built China? We did. If you buy anything made in China, you're aiding the bed. That's right. You're just as big a criminal as a person. So, it, it's a tough decision to make. It's not easy to buy a refrigerator today. We try to buy soap or dishwasher. We have an opportunity. And your opportunity is to exercise your pocketbook. And if Miller Brewing make a whole lot of money with that lousy ad that me? No. Because we exercise with our dollars, with our purchasing. That's the number one weapon we have. And the minute you sell out, you just voted for a Democrat. You're voting for another socialist, another Marxist, another person that's willing to sell you out for a buck. Yes. Thank you. That's the name of the game. And that's what I wanted to tell you about. So if you've got those sheets, make sure you get them to Sandy uh, before they meet. And Dennis has been trying to get me to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you like to spend some energy to serve your knowledge for me. Okay. I'm so selfish. Well, we, 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 have, we have to realize that when we have friends, like our friends from Hong Kong, and our friends all over, expatriates all over the world, we have a unique opportunity to gather, to go arm in arm, to be our friends. You know, he might think, think funny, but if I were in Hong Kong, I'd be speaking funny, right? right? I, I've been in Hong Kong. It's a beautiful place. But the communists have ruined it. We've got to take it back, and there are places like that all over the world. You know, but quickly, you know who's taken China's place as our number one business partner? Mexico. Who's exporting a whole lot of undocumented people from all over the world, fentanyl, drugs, slaves, back to Mexico because of money. So I'll visit there. I'll leave a vacation there because I don't live there. I want you to be aware of it. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.